Hi everyone, Anthony Morganti here. One question I often get about Lightroom, as a matter of fact, I received this question last night, is what is my order of events when I'm editing an image in Lightroom? Meaning, what do I do first, then what do I do second, and what do I do third, and so on. So, because I received this question so often, I thought I'd do this video and I'd show you my order of events when I'm editing an image in Lightroom. And I'm careful to say, this is my order of events because as far as Lightroom is concerned, it really doesn't matter what order you do things in. But I do recommend that you try to get a specific order for yourself for your editing because you'll be more able to get consistent results from image to image to image. If you edit one image one way and then another image you do totally differently and then a third image again differently, uh, you'll tend to not get consistent results. So we're going to edit two different images and then with these two images I'll show you my order of events. I have one image that I'm not going to be doing or using any masking at all. And then I have another image that requires some masking. So you'll see how I integrate masking into my order of events. Let's start with this image. The first thing I like to do is straighten and or crop the image. I like to do all my editing on my cropped image. So if I do need to crop, I'm going to crop right away so I see my cropped image as I'm editing. In this case here, this image doesn't really need to be cropped, but it is crooked very slightly. So I'm going to straighten it just a touch. All right, so we straighten the image. Now, the next thing I do is pick a profile. So I'll go to the basic tab, and in this case, it has the Adobe Color Profile, and I'll stay with that. Um, typically, you want to pick a profile very early in your workflow and do all your editing on top of the profile. So your profile is kind of your base where you're starting. So I'm going to stay with the Adobe Color in this instance. Now, the next thing I do after that is I edit Tone. Tone includes all these sliders in the Tone section, and it also includes the tone curve if I'm going to use that and it actually will include uh, color grading a bit and I'll explain that in a moment. So tone, what I'm going to do for this image is I'll bring highlights down a little bit. There's this really bright cloud right there. So I just want to bring it down so I see detail in that real bright cloud and I'll open up shadows so I see into the darkest part of the image and I see detail there. Then what I do is I get a white and black point. Several different ways you could do it. The way I prefer to do it is hold the Option key in on my Mac. If you have a PC, it would be the Alt key. Hold that key in. While clicking on the white slider, you'll see the screen turns black. I'll push that to the right until I see some colors come through. You can see that blue coming through. There's some green and red also. That means I'm starting to clip those color channels. Typically for whites, I don't like to clip the channels at all. Where you see white comes in, that means you're clipping all three channels. I want to back it off till all that color dissipates. I don't want to clip the whites or the highlights at all. So I'll just, just right about there is good. Next, I'll get a black point. Same way, I'll hold that Option key on my Mac. I'll key on a PC, click on blacks. This time, the screen turns white. And you can see already I'm starting to clip the green channel a little bit. Now, I don't mind clipping the shadows a little. Uh, I feel it gives my image a lot of tonal range if I have absolute black in the image all the way up to almost absolute white. So that's my white point. Now, if I needed to move exposure, I would. I almost never move the contrast slider. Um, by moving the whites and blacks, getting a white and black point, you're actually adding contrast to the image. So I most often don't ever need to move the contrast slider at all. Now, if I did feel like the tone was off and I needed to do, use the tone curve to still adjust tone, I would do that as well. In this case, I don't need to. I did mention that in color grading, believe it or not, you could affect tone. If I felt the midtones were off, what I could do is go to this midtone circle and not touch the color wheel at all. Don't affect color at all. Just go to this luminance slider down here and move that. If I move it to the right, I'm making the midtones brighter. If I move it to the left, I'm making the midtones darker. So I could move this and adjust midtones. And I may do that on some images. This image, maybe if I move it just a little bit like that, that looks pretty good. So I'm done with tone. Now my next step I do is if I need anything, um, any sensor spots or 
anything in the image needs to be removed, I'll go to the spot removal tool, use either the healing brush or the clone brush and get rid of that. In this case, it's not needed at all. So next step, after I'm done with tone, after I'm done with the healing brush or the spot removal tool to be more precise, is I would remove noise. Now, if I'm only using Lightroom to remove noise, I would do it right now. On the other hand, if I was using a third-party application for removing noise, that could be um, Topaz Labs to Noise AI or On One's No Noise AI or something like that. I want to do that even earlier in my workflow because those applications work best at removing noise when they have an image that isn't uh, heavily processed as far as tone is concerned, if you add a lot of contrast to an image, or maybe you even sharpen the image, it's more difficult for those applications to remove noise. So what I would do if I was using one of those applications, I would do the profile, right? I might do highlights and shadows. And if it needed a white balance adjustment, I'd probably do that as well. In because white balance on a raw file is more effective than when we send this image over to one of those third-party apps, it's going to come back as a TIFF or PSD, then white balance isn't as effective. So I might do white balance at all. Also, send it off to that third-party app, get the noise removed. When it comes back as a TIFF or PSD, I'll do the white and black point, and then I'll do the spot removal, as I mentioned, if needed. Um, and if I needed to do anything uh, with the tone curve or the color grading, I would do that as well. In this case, um, I didn't send it to the third-party app, so right, my order of events still are cropping, straightening, uh, then uh, profile, then tone. Now we're done with tone. Now the next thing I want to do is is remove noise in Lightroom. And to do that, what I'm going to do is zoom in. I like to hold the command key on my Mac control key on a PC and zoom into a part where I could see in very closely. Go down to the Detail tab. By default, uh, Lightroom already added a uh, color noise reduction at 25, so that's probably good. What I'll do is I'll just eyeball the noisiest part up here in the sky and move this noise reduction to the right till it's gone. This was shot at ISO 800, so there's quite a bit of noise. Then I'll go to, once it's gone, I'll go to the Detail tab and tweak that to the right a little bit and try to tease back some detail that might have got lost. And that looks pretty good. So I'm done with noise reduction. It's as simple as that. Now, the next thing I do after I do all that is color adjustments. And in this case, um, it's pretty colorful. So I don't think I need to move vibrance and saturation at all. But there is a bit of a blue color cast. Now I could go to the white balance sliders and try to move that or use the eyedropper. Now, because this has kind of a blue color cast, what I prefer to do is go to the tone curve and specifically go to the blue curve. And I actually did a video on this and how to do this. You'll notice how the blue curve in the upper left-hand corner is blue up here and down in the lower right is yellow. What you could do is put a point right in the middle and just drag this towards the yellow a little bit and you'll remove some of that blue color cast. That's the way I prefer to do it. All right, so that's that. I got rid of the color cast. Now I mentioned I don't think I need to move vibrance or saturation, but I am going to go to the HSL color tab, specifically the HSL section. The color section is the same exact thing. It's just graphically a little different, does the same exact adjustments. I just prefer to use the HSL section. And specifically, I go to the luminance sub tab, and I want to add some more tonal variance by adjusting the luminance values of the colors. Specifically, I'll go to yellow. See how there's some yellow in the trees? I'll move this to the right and make anything that's yellow in those trees a little brighter. I'll move to the green and make that a little darker. Maybe orange to the right a little bit. I can make the blue sky a little darker. Push that to the left just a little bit. If I feel that saturation needs to be um, pushed up a little bit for a specific color, I would do that as well with the saturation tab. I almost never move hue at all. So that's that. I'm done there. I, as I mentioned, I don't think I need to move vibrance saturation sliders at all for this image. Now, the next thing I do is sharpening. And sharpening, for me, includes these three sliders in the present section, dehaze, clarity, and texture. And it, of course, includes the sharpening slider in the detail tab. 
I'll start out with the presence sliders. This doesn't need any dehaze done at all. I like to work these sliders, by the way, from the bottom up. It doesn't need any dehaze at all, but it does need some clarity. So I'll add some clarity. I'll add some texture. Then I'll jump down to the detail tab, and it already added uh, sharpening by default to 40, and this is pretty sharp. So I don't think I need to add that at all. Now I will mask it so that it's only hitting the edges of things that need to be sharpened. And to use masking, I hold again the option camera Mac Alt can of PC, click where it's white. That means the sharpening is being applied. I only want it applied to the edges, so I'll move this to the right. You can see that black is starting to come in where it's black. We're not getting any sharpening at all. So we want to just sharpen the very edges. And that looks pretty good right there. So I'm done sharpening the image. I've pretty much done with the image. What I do now is finish up. So I'll go to effects and I'll just give it a little bit of a dark vignette. And this image is done. There's before and there's after. Now let's move to another one. Um, this one's going to need some masking done as well. But I still do things pretty much in the same order of events in that um, crop it or straighten it first. In this case it's a little crooked. So I'll straighten it. Then I go to the basic tab. I pick a profile. Let's just stay with the Adobe, Adobe Color Profile. Now the next thing is if I was using a third party application for noise reduction and this needed noise reduced, I would adjust the white balance if needed, then send it to that application. And then when it came back, I'd continue my adjustments. I may move highlights and shadows before I did that, but in this case I wouldn't. In this case, it doesn't really need any noise reduction at all. We shot at ISO 64, so that point is moot. But I will go then to, and I just did profile, I'll do the tone. And in this case, in most landscape images, I like to kind of open up the shadows by moving this to the right. In this case here, it's, it's not moving, too, not doing too much. Move this to left. Once I move those and it still looks kind of drab, I might then go to exposure and just bring exposure up a little bit. Then I'll get a white and black point. I'll hold in my option key on my Mac. Click on the white slider and move this to the right till I see some color come through and then back that off till it dissipates. Same thing for blacks. Hold that in. Get that white screen. Move this to left. I don't mind clipping the shadows that much. So, so far, so good. Tone is adjusted. I don't think I need to do anything with the tone curve or with this luminance slider in the color grading tab. So I don't need that. So now at this point, again, if it had, you know, sensor spots or if there was a bird way off in the distance that I didn't like the look of, I would use the spot removal tool to get rid of any of, you know, anything there I don't need, doesn't need any of that done to it. Now, if I wasn't using, and I'm not using a third party app to remove noise, I would remove noise at this point. But again, this was shot at ISO 64. There really is no noise, so I don't even have to worry about that. But before I go to color, if I look at the boat, the subject of the image, it's a little dark, a little bit drab. So I want to do masking on the boat and affect the tone of the boat with my mask. So I'll add a mask. I'll select the subject. You can see it selected the boat, but it kind of selected back here the water as well. So I'm going to subtract from the mask with a brush. And I'll come in here with a brush and, and get rid of some of this. Now I'm going to do this very quickly. Typically, if I'm doing this and I'm not doing a video, I'd probably try to do a much, much better job. I didn't want to do that last brush stroke, so I'll do that. So I try to come in and do a better, more effective, precise job. Well, let's just go with that, all right? And so what I'm doing now, because I have the mask on the boat and it seemed a little drab to me, I'll push up the exposure a little bit. I'll go to the whites and make that a little brighter, make the darker parts a little darker, add a little contrast to that boat with that. So I'm still adjusting tone before I even get to color. Oh, it looks pretty good. So I'm done with that. So that's how I integrate masking. Masking usually for me needs some tone adjustments and that's what I would do next. I like to do individual mask, meaning if I wanted to sharpen that boat, when I get to the sharpening part, I might do that in a separate mask. If I wanted to add um, uh, just like a saturation just to the boat, 
I would do a separate mask for that. I like to use individual masks for one for tone, one for sharpening. I, te that includes texture and clarity and dehaze to a point and uh, another mask for color. In this case, I just needed to adjust tone. So one mask was required. Now that that's done, I'll work on color. Now this is kind of drab looking. So I'm going to go to saturation and push that up. Looks pretty good. And then I'll go to that HSL tab. Again, I'm going to go luminate section. I'm going to make the blue sky a little darker. Let's see if you make the yellows a little brighter, makes the red a little, oops, red's up here, not green. Make that a little brighter. All right, so, so far, so good. Now, I'm pretty much done with color. I'll go to sharpening. And again, I work these sliders from the bottom up, dehaze. Maybe just a tiny bit of dehaze. Add some clarity. Add some texture. Go to the detail tab. Sharpening's at 40. It's fine. I could come in and mask it. Hold that Alt Option key in again and just mask it to the edges like that. And I am pretty much done. I'll go to Effects and pull that down a little. So that's my rough order of events. How I go about doing things in Lightroom, I find it gives me consistent processing from image to image to image because I stay with this kind of rough order of events. And, you know, I don't sweat it. Sometimes I might uh, jump down and add saturation to an image when I'm still working on tone. Um, doesn't really matter. But if you kind of do things th at least very roughly the same way, you'll find you'll get better results overall. So try to get an order of events, what you feel comfortable to edit your images in Lightroom, and I think uh, you'll find your editing will improve. Thank you, everyone who watches my videos. I really do appreciate it. Talk to you guys soon.